is Jean Dalbier from ICTP. So you've been with us since 2019 in the quantitative life sciences section, and you're doing research in many things, but among other in statistical physics uh, with connections to statistical inference, computer science, and machine learning. And today you will talk a little bit about phase transitions from physics to computer science. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Zach. Hello, everyone. So it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to, to be here today uh, for this, uh, this basic notion seminar. So uh, as uh, Zach mentioned, I, I'm, I'm a statistical physicist, but working really on, on various fields which may apparently be unrelated to physics. And what I want to do today is to, to show you that actually very uh, important, uh, one of the crucial notion of statistical physics, which is uh, phase transitions, are actually of crucial importance also uh, away from physics. And the, 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 the aim of the talk is to give you an overview of the very uh, large variety of systems in which this, this type of threshold phenomena where you have a, a, an abrupt change of the system behavior, of some complex system behavior, when some control parameter like the temperature or other more abstract parameters, as we will see, change. Uh, and I want to show that this type of phenomenon appears essentially everywhere in nature, but also in computer algorithms and these kind of things. So let us start with the basics. A single uh, molecule of water, so this is a very tiny object. Uh, it's uh, a tenth of a millionth of a millimeter. But if uh, I consider uh, very many of them, and when I say very many, I really emphasize on the very, of the order of 10 millions, billions, billions of them. So this is uh, the so-called Avogadro number, which is the typical number of molecules you can find in the drop uh, of, uh, of water, for example. Uh, notice that these type of numbers are much bigger than the numbers appearing in, in astrophysics or high energy physics. Uh, if you take a lot of them like this, uh, depending on some parameter here, the temperature, this may lead to very, very different results. So here you have, of course, ice. This is a kind of iceberg. Then you have the liquid state and you have the gas state. But what's, what is important to keep in mind here is that these three very uh, different uh, systems are made of the very same components, which are molecules of water. So at the microscopic level, uh, they look quite similar, but at the macroscopic level, of course, these systems are very different. They have different mechanical properties, optical properties, and so on and so forth. So really, the whole is more than the sum of its parts. Or as summarized by Philip Anderson, who was a Nobel Prize in 77, more is different. And what he means by different here is really different at a fundamental level. So let me continue to, to quote uh, Anderson. The behavior of large and complex aggregates of elementary particles, it turns out, is not to be understood in terms of simple extrapolation of a few particles. Instead, at each level of complexity, entirely new properties appear, and the understanding of the new behaviors requires research, which I think is as fundamental in nature as in any other. So uh, here is uh, the kind of pictures that we like in physics. This is called a phase diagram. So it essentially tells you in which macroscopic global uh, state can be found the, 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 the water, the system of interest here, which are molecules of water, as a function of control parameters. So here I put the pressure, which is in bar, and the temperature in Kelvin. And you see different regions which are separated by lines, and these lines correspond to phase transition lines where you change from one macroscopic state to another one. So for example, uh, the ice, so the, the solid state is here where molecules are uh, very compactified and they are very ordered. You have a kind of crystalline structure. Mars is here in the phase diagram, so most of the, if not only the, uh, the, the water on Mars is in the solid form, the planet Earth is here in the middle of the liquid phase. That's why the, the planet is blue and not so, so much liquid water. But we're actually close to the phase transition line, and therefore, we also find ice on Earth. Uh, and then you have the gas uh, state, where essentially particles are uh, freely moving around. Uh, and Venus uh, is here. So notice that the, the density of the gas, for example, is much lower than the one of the liquid than the one of the ice. So this is what we call a phase diagram. 
let me just give you a bit of physics, uh, the intuition, I don't know the intuition, but the kind of tools that we like as physicists uh, to understand this kind of uh, pictures. And this is called the, the, the thermodynamic potential. So essentially there exists a function that I would call the free energy that I will describe a bit later, which is a function that when you plot it as a function of some or order parameter, so the order parameter is what? It's a quantity that essentially describes the macroscopic state in which the, the, the system is found. So for example, at a high density, it means that particles are compact altogether, you should be in a kind of solid state, okay? While at lower densities, you, you should be in a kind of liquid state and much lower densities, this is the gas state, okay? And there exists this function that if you plot it for a given temperature, let's say 0.2 Celsius, it will look like this. So it will have a minimum at a density of zero, which in this case is by definition uh, the one of liquid. Uh, and if you continue, if you decrease a bit the temperature, you see that at zero degrees Celsius, you have a second minimum that appears. Uh, and that will become the global minimum if you continue to reduce the temperature. And this corresponds to the solid state. So essentially from this picture, let's say there exists this function that you can compute in some way, you can read off directly in which macroscopic global state the system, the complex system you are studying will be found, okay? And the minimum of this function corresponds to what we call the equilibrium state in physics. So what is this function, this free energy? So this free energy is a way to understand the perpetual tension between order and disorder. So let me say that I'm uh, an experimental physicist. I'm in some, uh, some lab uh, and I can fix for my experiment some control parameters. This is why I, can, I call them control parameters. I can control them. For example, the temperature or the pressure or in, in a natural environment, this is fixed by nature, okay? I will then define a number of order parameters, which is a set of quantities of, of, that I can measure for my system and that essentially define that, that describe my system. Uh, so for example, this can be the density, the average, the average density of molecules in the water, which, which allows to tell if you are in the solid, liquid or gas state, or the magnetization, which is a kind of measure of how uh, uh, atoms are aligned, if they have a preferred uh, direction, or any, uh, so the magnetization is a global quantity, you look at all atoms and you look if there is a common alignment, or any other macroscopic global property of the system that you are interested about. So these are the order parameters, what you can measure. So this is the way you describe the system. And then there are, very, uh, there are two very important quantities that enter into the game that, that really control the physics of the system. The first one is of course the energy and the E of O, where O is the set of order parameters is essentially the cost for the system to be in the macroscopic state O, that is described by these order parameters. So usually physical systems like to lower their energy and this leads generally towards more order. So for example, ice has a, has a lower energy than the liquid state and ice is much more structured. You have, you have a crystalline structure which is, which is much more uh, ordered. The second quantity that only enters the game where, where you have complex systems like the one I will be interested in uh, today is the entropy, which is essentially the logarithm of the number of microscopic configurations of the system that correspond to a given macroscopic state O, okay? So maybe you have many possible configurations of the atom that correspond to the macroscopic state gas or liquid or ice, and the entropy essentially counts the number of such configurations. And you need to take the logarithm because there are so many, actually there are exponentially many in the number of uh, atoms or simple entities that form your complex system, that if you don't take the log, this number is just too huge to be compared with the energy. So you need to take the log. And higher entropy leads generally to more disordered systems. So the gas, uh, the, the, in the gas, the particles have more degrees of freedom to move around. So the entropy is higher are more configurations corresponding to gas than the ice, which is highly structured. Okay. And so the free energy is essentially the difference between the energy and the entropy, where the entropy, there is a minus sign here, and the entropy is weighted 
by the temperature, which is therefore a way to tune the tension between order and disorder. So we come back to this picture. I have uh, my free energy here. Now we understand a bit what it means. And so indeed, if we look at a high temperature above zero degrees Celsius, the minimum, so what I should observe, the equilibrium state, which is the state minimizing the free energy, is the liquid state. And indeed, at high temperature, the, the, the term that matters the most in the free energy when the temperature is high must be the entropy because I have a bigger weight here. And therefore, I need to go to a state with bigger entropy and the liquid state has indeed a higher entropy than the solid state. So this is the term that wins, the disordered term, if you want. Uh, if I reduce the temperature, what will, what will matter the most then is the energy term because this term will become small. And so if I want to minimize my free energy to find the equilibrium state, the one I would observe experimentally, physically, I need to minimize the energy and the solid state, the ice, has a lower energy and therefore my system is found in the solid state, okay? So now what I want to, to I want to move a bit away from this classical uh, physics models and to show you that these notions of phase transitions and uh, the language of statistical physics and all that can be applied to a variety of uh, other uh, nice systems that actually appear everywhere in, in essentially all contexts that you can think about. Uh, as long as you have enough complexity. Again, a complex system is what? It's something that is made of a very huge number of interacting entities, okay? And what I claim and what I will show you is that in such complex systems, you essentially always have the presence of this phase transition. So let us start with a, an example of imitation effects like in financial markets or votes. So I will consider a simple model of, of, uh, of uh, votes where essentially you have two binary, uh, you have two candidates, A and B, and each person, each voter, uh, each individual is indexed by I that goes from one to N, is modeled by a, a variable that I call SI of T. And this SI of T is essentially the choice at time T of individual I, okay? So if, if the individual I would be given the, the choice to vote at time T, it would, uh, it would be plus one if its choice is A and minus one if it, was, if it would be, okay? So we'll consider a very simple model where essentially voters are only influenced by a global trend. That is, uh, at each time we have a kind of survey of what's the, the trend in the population of voters. And uh, we'll model that in the following way. We'll say that the probability that at a given time, the individual I votes for A, which is the same as the probability that the variable SI of T is equal to one, will be proportional to the exponential of the trend divided by what I call the temperature. I will come back to what it means. But what is the trend first? The trend is defined to be uh, the difference between the fraction of individuals in the population that are voting at a given time for uh, candidate A minus the fraction of individuals voting for B, okay? that I can also just rewrite as the sum of these variables. And so you see when there are as many people voting for, for A and B, this sum will cancel, will be zero. And essentially in this case, uh, the probability for a given individual to vote is totally random. So the probability to vote for A, so here there is a typo, it's probability of individual to vote for A, will be 0 0.5. While if the trend, this quantity, is bigger than zero, then it means that each individual will be biased towards voting for A. When it's, will, when it's negative, the trend means that the trend goes towards B and people will tend to vote more often for B. And what is this temperature here? I can, you see that when the temperature goes to infinity, this essentially means that this, uh, this trend does not matter anymore. It means that individuals are not uh, influenced anymore by, by the global trend. While when it goes to zero, this exponential, this shape becomes extremely peaked. And it means that people are strongly biased, much strongly biased uh, by the trend. So I can think of this temperature as the average independence of individuals 
with respect to the dominating trend. Sorry. So it's a kind of uh, um, level of rebellion, if you want. So let's uh, simulate uh, this, uh, this, this, um, this system and see what happens. So here is a small code where I essentially simulate this dynamic of people voting at, at different times and that are influenced by uh, this global trend. So let me consider first a very small system with five individuals. Here, what happens is that over time, we see that, so minus one, when this curve touch minus one, it means that at this time, all individuals would agree on voting for a candidate B. Well, when it's plus one, all agree on candidate A, and in between, it means that uh, the, the, there is a different fraction for A and B. And you see kind of fluctuations like this, and there is no consensus that, that appears, essentially. It's quite erratic. I will increase a bit the number of uh, individuals. I simulate again. And you see, again, the same kind of patterns uh, with, a, with a kind of uh, change of behavior of the population like this at times goes on. But it's still, it looks still quite random. Now I increase a bit more, 20. And we start to see something interesting. You see that the time window on which individuals agree starts to increase. OK? So you see a kind of patterns that appears. But now I go to 100. So it's a kind of large system. And what happens? What happens is the following. You have what we call a polarization effect. So this is a kind of breaking of the symmetry between the, the, the candidate A and B, or the state minus 1 and plus 1, if you want. So the, essentially, the, the, feel, the, 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 the trend created by the population uh, becomes strong enough so that uh, if uh, some individual starts to, to try to, to, to vote something else, essentially, they will be uh, they, they will be, the population will have a stronger effect and will win against that. And essentially, the whole population is stuck there in the state, which is the, the minus one state in this case. And this is what we call uh, a, a, a spontaneous um, symmetry breaking in physics. So you have a breaking between the plus one and minus one symmetry. And you see that if I simulate the same model, but on much longer times, what happens is that you see that the system will first polarize. So the population will agree, essentially, on which candidate to vote for, for a very long time. But suddenly, for some reason, because of subtle correlations and probabilistic effects, you have a drop. And all the population then changes. So they, they, they change choice. And now, then they vote for the other candidate. OK? This kind of phenomenon is very generic. in. Um, in, in complex systems. And this illustrates this, this uh, nice sentence, which is, again, more is different. For 10 individuals, you have this kind of erratic behavior, while for 100, you have this polarization effect that creates a spontaneous breaking, uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking. But keep in mind that these two systems, they follow the same rule. The only thing that changes is the number of individuals, the number of, of variables that enter your system. And this is the type of phenomenon that leads, uh, for example, uh, to cracks in financial markets. OK? Actually, the model that we just simulated, which is a, a baby model of, of imitation, of course, uh, oversimplified, but still it contains a lot of interesting phenomena, is actually very closely related to, uh, to an important model from physics. I think most of you uh, will have heard about it, the so-called Ising model of ferromagnetism. Ferromagnetism is the fact that you have magnets, that uh, essentially atoms in magnets tend to align in the same direction. They all carry a kind of little uh, magnet themselves. And when all these little magnets align together, you have a global magnetization. And therefore, you get a magnet. And this is modeled by what we call spins in physics, which are just up or down variables, which interact through, this, uh, through these green interactions here. And these interactions, what they do is that they, they try to align spins. So you can think of that as energy uh, contributions that are lowered when the spins align together. Okay? And the temperature is a kind of measure here of the fluctuations of these spins. Okay? 
how how strongly they are affected by this uh, by this um, alignment by this energy term that that try to to align that. So at high temperature, what happens is that essentially most of the spin are in random positions. So you don't have a global magnetization. Half of them are in up, half of them are in down, and they fluctuate like this. And this is equivalent to our simulations where I, can, I take a high temperature, which means that our voters are very weakly affected by the global trend. And in this case, you see that there is no global consensus. Uh, the, the average vote, which is the equivalent of the magnetization in this system. Again, the magnetization is the global alignment is, uh, of these uh, arrows. It's the sum of all these arrows is uh, around zero and fluctuate around zero. But if I decrease the temperature, which in our voter models means that people are more keen to follow the global trend, at some point you have a phase transition towards the ferromagnetic state, which means that almost all uh, spins will align together and you create a global magnetization. We can again read that from our free energy that I plot for different temperatures here as a function of the magnetization, which is our uh, order parameter. And you see that when the magnetization, uh, when the temperature is large, it has a minimum in zero. So there is no global magnetization. We are in this region of the phase diagram or equivalently in this type of states here. Well, if I decrease the temperature at some point, there are two minima that appears here. So it's here, I'm at the critical temperature and I see a global magnetization, a global alignment of the spins that starts to emerge which is the equivalent of this polarization phenomenon, in this uh, imitation model that we consider. And the same type of transitions also happen in uh, collective animal behavior. So let me show you uh, some nice pictures. So here is a picture of uh, huge colonies of insects, what we call so active matter in physics, where each individual can, can make decisions by themselves, but then you study huge colonies of them. This is a swarming state, which is a kind of disordered state. Uh, where individuals essentially do not uh, do not follow specific um, direction. Actually, here they, it looks that they follow specific direction. This is more a polarized state. It's an ordered state. Disordered would be more like flies uh, packed together with a center of mass that don't uh, move much. And here is uh, two other states of this uh, active matter systems. These uh, these animals. Here are fishes found in the, the so-called myling state where they 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 kind of rotate around the center. And you have a polarized state here of birds, which are huge colonies of starlings. Uh, I would like to show you uh, a nice video. So here is a real uh, video of these birds uh, that form this kind of very complex colonies. And what is nice, what is important to notice is you see that this kind of system are kind of critical. What does it mean? They are really close to a phase, tran phase transition in the sense that they are nor liquid nor solid. So they're, they're kind of liquid because you have this very, um, you have kind of independent parts, but at the same time, you have a global coherency, which, which is like a solid as well. So this, these systems are really critical. They are at the edge of a phase transition. And this is not for nothing. These are, uh, this comes from biological reasons, of course. Okay, so this type of uh, systems can be very simply modeled by this so-called, for example, V-shake model, where each individual, what it does is that at each time it looks at its closest neighbors. What it does is that it approximately computes uh, the average angles of all its neighbors, and it tries to follow this direction. Of course, the computation is not perfect, and therefore, we model that by adding some noise. So in equations, this is very simple. The angle in which uh, the individual i will move at time uh, t plus delta t, so at the next step, is essentially the average direction of its neighbors plus some noise, which models the imperfection of the computation by this, uh, by this bird. So this term is a kind of energy term that will tend to create order. This term will contribute to align all the birds together to, um, to create a kind of magnetization of, of, for the birds, a global alignment. 
while this term, which is the noise term, can be thought as a, an entropic term that tends uh, towards more disorder in the system. Okay. So um, maybe I can show you a small simulation of this model. So this simulation was not done by me. So here they define an order parameter, which is essentially the global alignment of all the velocities. So you sum over all the individuals in the population, their uh, directions, essentially. And this is called the velocity correlation, which I like to call the magnetization, but this is the same. And um, so it is essentially zero if the motion of the birds are totally random and one when they're all perfectly aligned. And what they will do is that they will tune as time goes on the strength of the noise, which reduces here. And you see that as the strength of the noise reduces, this global alignment increases, this correlation between the alignment. And you indeed see that there is more and more structure in the movement of these birds. At the beginning, it was kind of totally random. And at the end, we see a kind of global behavior where they follow each other, which I think is really nice. All right, so let's now go towards maybe systems in which I think most of you wouldn't imagine that this type of notions would appear, but actually they do. And in particular, I will start with problems in computer science and discrete mathematics uh, in, in uh, graph theory and combinatorial optimization, and I will tell you what it means. So the fundamental question uh, behind that is, uh, is a kind of basic question, but at the same time, extremely deep, which is the following. Why some problems are easy to solve while others are not at all? So this is uh, something very clear, uh, but uh, is there a fundamental reason for that? And uh, you must uh, have guessed the fundamental reason between uh, different hardness for some problems is related in some way to phase transitions. And this is what I want to illustrate now. So uh, let me introduce uh, the father of what we call combinatorial optimization and graph theory, which was a problem uh, that people was were wondering about in Konigsberg, which is a city in Russia, which is now called Kaliningrad uh, in the 18th century. So the name has changed, it is here on the map. And uh, so the game was the following. They, they, so this is the map of the city at, at this time. So there were an island, and then there are two banks here and another island here. And there are uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. There are seven edges uh, connecting these different parts of the city. And the question that people were trying to answer is, can we find a path that crosses all bridge a single time? And really what is important here is a single time. So people were just trying like this, different solution. Okay, let, let us try, let's play a bit. Okay, so we missed one. Unfortunately, we cannot reach that bridge from here, so we didn't find a path. Let's try another one. We still unfortunate, we didn't find a solution. Okay, so people were trying thousands and thousands of combination uh, and never found one. And actually, uh, the reason is that there is not. And uh, this has been understood by uh, Leonard Euler was a mathematician and uh, what he did to answer this question is essentially develop uh, what is now a very active field of discrete mathematics which is graph theory so he took the map he defined a scheme so he simplified the map and then he put on each banks here on each side uh, of the river and on the islands uh, a dot okay and what he did is that he connected these dots if there is actually an edge on the original map that connects these parts of the city. And what you obtain is the first graph uh, ever, uh, which is the following. And uh, here, so for example, this node corresponds to this one. And you see that you have an edge connecting to this one and an edge connecting to this one. Actually, you have two edges connecting to this one, which are these two edges and so on and so forth. And uh, Euler told us, after some work, if more than two nodes have an odd number of edges, there's no solution. You can not find a path that crosses all bridge at a single time. So this uh, became, uh, this has a name now, this problem, of course, in reference to Euler. This is, can we find an Eulerian path? 
And so uh, the question is, uh, the, the, the answer is very easy. Just look at your graph, answer the following. Is there more than two nodes that have an odd number of edges? Here the answer is yes. We have one here, for example, one here and one here. And therefore, uh, there is no Eulerian path. If the answer would be no, there would exist an Eulerian path. So essentially, we have a problem here that is easy to solve. We have a simple algorithm, which is just to check that, to answer the problem. Okay. By the way, now the, the, the map of the city had changed a bit. They, they essentially destroyed these two edges. And so therefore, now there exists an Eulerian path. So in 2020, the, the solution is, is actually trivial. All right, let me now discuss another problem that looks uh, very uh, closely connected, but uh, that is fundamentally different, which is the so-called Hamiltonian path problem, which is the following. Can we find a path that encounters each node a single time? So before, for the Eulerian path problem, I wanted to path through each edge, each edge. Now I want to path through each node a single time, okay? And actually, to the best of our knowledge, the best solution is just to try all paths until finding one that works. So there is no smart way to find a solution to this problem. But the problem is actually, that there are exponentially many solutions, different paths, not solutions, different paths to test until hopefully finding one solution, if there exists one. But let's just remember all together again how fast exponentials are increasing. Exponential 10 is 20,000. Exponential 30 is 10 to the 13, so it's 10,000 billions. So it's really a huge number. So forget it. Uh, for bigger numbers. Actually, it's easy to show that even if n would be of the order of 50, so n is the number of nodes in the graph for which you want to, to find an Hamiltonian path, it would take you more than the age of the universe on a modern supercomputer to test all paths. So essentially, you can just forget about it. This problem is not solvable efficiently. At least we don't know how to do. And therefore, answering the question, is there an Hamiltonian path, is a very hard problem. So there are easy problems and hard problems. And hard in the sense here that we don't know efficient algorithms to solve that. And there is a name for that in computer science. These are problems that belong to so-called P class, where P stands for polynomial. It means that there is a polynomial time algorithm, so an algorithm that makes a polynomial number of operations polynomial in n, the number of nodes in your graph, to solve the problem. NP means that there is no such polynomial algorithm. The only thing we know at best is an exponential uh, time algorithm. So a very costly algorithm that usually you cannot run. And actually this problem because, uh, be, um, belongs to a special class of such complicated problems that we call NP complete class, where complete here means that if you can solve efficiently this type of problem. Again, we don't know how to, but if you would be able to, you could solve an extremely large class of other complicated problems, essentially almost all hard problems for a computer. Um, so if you solve one, you solve them all, and you solve them all. And proving that these two classes are not the same in the sense that there actually is a class of problem for which there is no polynomial time algorithm, because we don't know there is not, we just know that we didn't find any. Proving this inequality, that these two types of problems are really fundamentally different, is one of the most uh, deep questions in computer science. If you can solve it, solve it, you get $1 million. And that's not a joke, this is one, one of the millennium prizes. All right, so now I want uh, to ask the following question. Are all uh, NP-complete problems, so essentially hard problems, are they really all the time hard? What do I mean here? These problems are hard in general. This is what we've seen. But sometimes they're actually very easy. Here is a graph. And if I ask you to find an Hamiltonian path for this specific graph, the answer is absolutely trivial because of the structure of the graph. Just start from a node and follow the graph. And you just found an Hamiltonian path. So this is very easy. So something must happen in between these two extreme regimes. You have a regime where the problem is really hard. We don't know any algorithm able to do something smart. And there is another regime 
where the problem is absolutely trivial. Okay, you give it uh, to a two-year-old kid and he solves it. So something must happen to bridge this kind of two complexity regimes. And of course, you have guessed probably the, the connection, uh, what makes, what, what separates this kind of two regimes are phase transitions. So to illustrate that, let me introduce another uh, such NP-complete problem, which is very nice, which is the so-called coloring problem. So the, it's very easily stated, but at the same time, very hard. That's why it's, it's such a nice problem. Imagine you have a map. Um, and I ask you, can you find a coloring, which means a way to color the different countries so that two countries that share a border do not have the same color, OK? And there is actually a theorem, which is the so-called four-color theorem, that tells you that four colors are enough to properly color any map. Properly color means, again, that no, uh, no neighbors have the same color. So this has been conjectured a long time ago, and it took more than 100 years to be proved. And the algorithm to do that efficiently uh, took additional 20 years to, to be obtained. So how to turn that into a graph a problem coming from graph theory. So just add, a, just associate a node to each country, then put an edge between any two nodes uh, that share a border on the original map, and you just get, uh, you just got a graph. And now the, the four color theorem in this language reads the following. Uh, four colors are enough to properly color any planar graph. So planar graph means that you can essentially draw it on a, on a surface so that Two edges will never cross. There are no crossing edges, OK? Right. So now we want to study how we go from simple instances of this coloring problem to hard instances, which are really difficult to color. So to do that, to, we need to define a kind of ensemble of graphs, uh, which will be random graphs. So how to generate a random graph? You just take a certain number of nodes, let's say, 100 nodes, then you fix a number of edges, in this case 218, and you just connect nodes uh, randomly uh, with this fixed number of edges, okay? Um, so here is a, a representation of such a, such a random graph. And the, color, the, the problem that we will uh, fix ourselves here is, can we color this random graph with just three colors? Of course, if you would have access to infinitely, to as many colors as you want, the problem would be trivial to just color, color them with a different one. Here, we constrain ourselves to have only three colors. Uh, notice that even if we would have four, it would be non-trivial because here, this is not a planar graph. You see that things uh, intersect a lot. So this graph, you cannot represent it uh, on, a, on a plane, okay, without intersection. So now, now we have this ensemble of random graphs. Let me, um, let me uh, define a control parameter that will uh, allow us to tune the complexity of the problem. So our control parameter, like the, the temperature in physics, is here the density of edges, which means uh, essentially the number of edges divided by the number of nodes, okay? That you can think as the average number of borders between countries in the, in the example of the map, okay? So when this thing is high, it means that you have very many small countries uh, that have a lot of neighbors. When this is small, it means that you have essentially very few large countries and it's much easier. So a small c, the graph typically looks like this. You have many nodes that some are just separate of all the others. Uh, you have few connections like this. So it's very easy to find the coloring. While for large c, it's very hard to find colorings because you have many connections and therefore the, the the nodes are highly constrained. If I put a color here, it means that I cannot choose the same color for all these guys, which is a hard constraint. All right, so now let me take the best algorithm that we know to solve this problem and run it on many instances for many different random graphs for a fixed average connectivity, which is my control parameter. And I do the statistics. I compute what is the fraction of random graphs that I can color with my algorithm as a function of this C. And what you, what, you will, uh, what you will see if you try the experiment is that until some threshold, essentially your algorithm performs extremely well, it always finds solution, and suddenly you have a drop in performances like this, 
And above this threshold, which is extremely sharp and that gets sharper as the, as the number of nodes increase, we go from 50 to 100, 100 is the, is the red curve. Uh, above this threshold, essentially, your algorithm is totally uh, stuck. It won't find any coloring. And the reason is that actually in, deep in this region uh, with high probability, there are no ways to color the graph. But here you have a region where still you find some, but you see that the computational time required to do so explodes, seems to grow extremely fast like this. And this is nothing else than the appearance of a phase transition in a combinatorial optimization problem. We, the, the algorithm trying to solve this problem is experiencing uh, a phase transition and therefore the problem in this region becomes extremely hard, while in this region, the problem is extremely easy. And in this region, the problem is essentially impossible to solve. You don't have colorings for your graph. And this defines a phase diagram, exactly what I, like what I've shown for water at the beginning, except that we're talking about the behavior of an algorithm. And you, you have different phases for, for this uh, coloring problem, okay? And this can be put in analogy with physics, again, the easy regime could, can be thought as the liquid phase where essentially particles can move freely around. So a lot of degrees of freedom. It's easy to move things and to find colorings. While the hard and impossible regime, uh, the graph is highly constrained. It's very rigid, which can be uh, linked to the glass phase in physics. And actually, it can be more than linked. Uh, the, the tools coming from the study of glassy systems in physics in statistical physics are really the ones that are appropriate to describe all this region of the phase diagram. Let me uh, now uh, discuss a last, uh, not a last, uh, another set of problems which, uh, which I find fascinating and where again a uh, phase transition will appear, uh, which, which are problems of a signal hidden in noise. So this is called what, uh, inference. And uh, in inference, the, the problem is always the same. You have some hidden signal, some piece of information that has been corrupted by noise, and your task is to recover the signal, okay? So uh, let me discuss uh, the, 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 the father of, of inference problem, which is the so-called communication problem, which gave birth to what we call information theory in 1948. So the problem is the following. You have an emitter, and a receiver that wants to exchange information that you can think as bits, like zero and ones. You can always represent information zero and ones in the numerical world. Um, so our dear Bob is trying to, to, to say to, to, to Alice that he feels kind of strange because he's blue, which is indeed strange. But unfortunately, Alice is not uh, hearing, uh, hearing him properly. So what she asks very naturally is to repeat. Can you repeat the message, please? And indeed, Shannon, who is the father of information theory, who is an engineer from MIT, understood why uh, he has to repeat. He's actually trying to communicate at a rate, at a speed, if you want, that is too high. So let me explain what I mean here. So the communication problem, you have again this emitter and receiver that wants to exchange a piece of information. But there is no way, there exists no perfect communication channel. There is always noise, interferences. There is always some source of randomness that will corrupt the information that you want to exchange. And this can be modeled, for example, in the simplest case, but what we call in, in coding theory, in communications, the binary erasure channel, or BECP. What does it mean? This channel, which is a probabilistic model of, of information corruption, it takes, for example, as input a zero, and with probability one minus p, it will output the bit without any error. But with probability p, which is typically not too large, it will output nothing. So it's essentially erased, it fully destroys the bit. And it is the same, it is symmetric with the bit one, okay? So if you communicate, if you try to communicate through this channel, a fraction p, a random fraction p of the bits will just be erased, fully lost. The question is, is there a way to robustify communication with respect to noise? Is there a way to, 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 to communicate any way despite the fact that there is noise? And actually, Alice, uh, without realizing, found the solution directly. There is a solution. Just repeat 
you need to add redundancy, which is the key ID behind communications. So here, what you can do, for example, let's say you want to communicate hello, which in binary form could be 001. Uh, instead of just sending these bits like this uh, and uh, uh, taking uh, the risk of losing a fraction of them so that the, the message could not be decoded at the receiver side, just repeat it. So repeat it three times, for example. So here I just repeat my message three times. It's this repetition code R3. And what I call the rate is the number of information bits divided by the number of actually transmitted bits through the communication channel. So in this case, I want to transmit three bits and I send nine and therefore the rate is one third or equivalently the rate is one divided by the redundancy and here the redundancy is three. Okay, so it's very simple. And what Shannon understood is something absolutely fundamental, which is the fact that there is an absolute limit to the rate at which you communicate. So what do I mean by that? If you allow yourself a target error because there is no way to communicate perfectly uh, there, is, there will be always error, but what you can do is to try to minimize this error. So let's say you allow yourself a very small uh, target error, or almost zero. Shannon tells you that actually there is a rate above which you cannot communicate. At, at maximum for this channel, for this eraser channel with probability 0 0.1 of erasing bits, you will never cross this communication rate, okay? If you allow yourself a higher Error, this curve is, is moving a bit. We don't see it on the, on the graph. It's moving a bit on, on the right side. Uh, you can communicate as, at a slightly higher rate, but not much. And this is really a fundamental uh, limit to communication. Above this line, it is impossible. And below this line, communication is actually possible. And by impossible here, I mean independently of any coding scheme. So for example, here we use the repetition code. The repetition code has a rate of one third, which is here, but it leads to a very high error. It's not, a, I mean, at the decoder side, you will get many errors. What you can do to lower the probability of error is to increase the number of repetition. This is five, et cetera, et cetera. And this is 61 repetition. So you see that we arbitrarily lowered the error, but the price we pay is that we tremendously reduced the rate of communication. So there is an absolutely fundamental trade-off between, um, between communication rate and error, probability of error, the, the fraction of bits that are lost at the receiver side. If you want to increase the rate, you need to pay the price of having more errors. If you want to reduce the number of errors, you pay the price of reducing the communication rate. And this is the best curve you can reach. So uh, our uh, dear Claude Shannon answers to, to, to our friends uh, Alice and Bob, whatever you do, and even if you had access to the most advanced alien technology that will ever exist in the universe, you will never be able to communicate at a rate exceeding the capacity of the noisy channel you are using. There is a fundamental phase transition that prevents you to do so. I'm really sorry. And so uh, our friends are a bit disappointed and poor Alice is still not hearing very well, apparently. All right. So let me uh, discuss uh, something that I, I find very nice, which is uh, the strategy that nature has found to solve hard problems. So what do I mean by that? We have this uh, plot that I just showed you. So you, you, you observe that with our repetition code here, we still have, even if we repeat a lot, we still have a very large gap between the optimal curve Okay, the optimal trade-off between error and communication rate, and what we actually reach with this communication scheme, this repetition code. So is there a way in some sense to close this gap? And nature has found a way to close this kind of gaps. So let me illustrate that again, coming back to water. Imagine that we have water uh, at above zero degrees Celsius. You can do the experiment. If you lower the temperature of this water slowly enough, and if the water is very pure, it will stay liquid even until minus 40 degrees Celsius. So the water is trapped in a so-called supercooled state. So essentially you see that because you are in, a, in the liquid state, which is this minimum of the, the free energy, you see that when you decrease the temperature, the minimum is now here, but there is a barrier between those two states, which is here. So if you don't help in some way your system to, to, to jump over this barrier, 
you will just stay here forever, okay? You will get stuck um, for very long times and actually for infinite time if, if the, system, the size of the system is big enough. So uh, your, your, your water remains liquid. But if you help the system a bit by punching on it, by adding a bit of energy locally, essentially you allow this ball to jump in the equilibrium state, which should be solid at a temperature which is below zero degrees Celsius. And you create a small nucleus of crystal. Okay, this water is, is at a temperature which is below zero. And this crystal propagates along the system as a wave like this. And therefore, this, at the end, thanks to this nucleation effect that starts from the, the seed, the nucleus here, the whole system finds the equilibrium. And actually, quite amazingly, we can use this ID to obtain error correcting codes, so ways to add redundancy for communicating that allow to reach the Shannon capacity. And this is called spatial coupling. The idea is to create a code, a way to to correlate our bits a bit more smartly than just doing repetitions in a way that you create a kind of 1D chain like this. And the idea is that you have a kind of nucleus. So let me first say what are these, uh, these boxes. These are called parity checks. These guys tell that the, it, their neighbors, so the, the bits to which they are connected, the sum has to be even. So essentially the emitter and receiver for communication, they agreed before communication that whatever signal will be transmitted, it will, it will verify all these constraints. So for example, the, the bit number uh, one, two, and three, the sum of them has to be an even number, okay? So now we send our bits that verify these constraints and at the receiver side, Alice, she receives this version. So some of the bits has been erased, unfortunately. But you see, we designed the code in the way that the first bit is connected to a single check. So even if it is erased, we know for sure that it has to be a zero because the sum has to be an even number. It cannot be a one. And now you see that, that now that we inferred that we reconstructed this bit, we can now reconstruct this one because I have a zero, a one. And if I want the sum of these three bits here to be an even number, this one has to be a one. It cannot be a zero. So this information, this seed helped me to reconstruct the next bit, which will help to reconstruct the next and the next and so on and so forth. And actually you get a reconstruction wave, which is behind, it is exactly the same physics as this super cool water. And this is not an analogy. I mean, this is really the same phenomenon that appears. And you have a phase transition from this super cool state to the equilibrium state, which is the crystal. And in the context of uh, this uh, problem, Crystal means reconstructing the information. So the information that was sent to this binary chan uh, eraser channel here was this image of, uh, of, um, of the woman. And you see that you see a wave of propagation, a wave of reconstruction that starts from the first bits and that is propagated inwards the signal like this, exactly like in the water, which I find really beautiful. So thanks to this technique, we managed to fully close the gap between what we obtain algorithmically and what we can obtain optimally. And so uh, Shannon is happy because Shannon told us there is an absolute limit, but he never, never actually gave us the recipe to reach this limit. And it took more than uh, 40 years actually to get error correcting codes that are able to reach this limit. And what I just told you about, this specially coupled code, are, uh, is a class of codes able to do so. Actually, there are only two classes of such uh, error coding codes. Let me uh, quote uh, Richard Feynman, who was a Nobel Prize from 65. The science of thermodynamics began with an analysis by the great engineer Sadi Carnot of the problem of how to build the best and most efficient engine. And this case constitutes one of the few famous cases in which engineering has contributed to fundamental physical theory. Another example that comes to mind is the more recent analysis of information theory by Claude Shannon. These two analyses incidentally turn out to be closely related. So Feynman, of course, has understood um, at this time that information theory and statistical physics and thermodynamics were extremely close uh, um, fields of science. Uh, let me um, discuss another example coming from machine learning. Uh, and artificial intelligence. So in this example, 
uh, I will discuss one, one uh, specific field of machine learning, which is called supervised uh, learning. So the idea of supervised learning is the following. I give you a, a bunch of, uh, of examples. Okay, of, so each image is what I call a data point. And these data points are, are labeled, which means that for all of these data points, I also, I also give you the answer, the, the, the category to which belong to this data point. Okay, and uh, so this bunch of data, of labeled data, uh, is called the training data. And what we want is to have uh, uh, an algorithm, uh, a procedure that outputs from this training data a predictive model for new unseen data, which were not part of the training data. What do I mean by that? Once we have our predictive model, what we want is that if I take a new example that is unlabeled, Okay, that was not part of the training data. So our predictive no model uh, never seen this image before. I want that our model is able to generalize in the sense that for this new data point, it outputs the proper label, in this case, a dog. So uh, let's, look, let's look at a cartoon version of this problem. So here is some uh, labeled data. I have one cat and two dogs. So I train an algorithm that in this case will just try to find a, a linear, uh, just a plane to separate the data. So let's say that this is what the algorithm output. This is our classifier in a sense that when we are on the left side, the algorithm would tell you this is a dog. When we're on the right side, the algorithm would tell you our predictive model would tell you this is a cat. Okay, let's add some, uh, let's test that on new unseen data. Unfortunately, we have errors because here you see that this dog would really, as, as, as the interface is not properly classified. Maybe it would be classified as a cat and this cat would be classified as a dog. So our algorithm is not yet very able to generalize. So now we give labels, so a bit more data to this algorithm to train it more. The data, the, the algorithm is able to fine tune. This is our new predictor, our new model. Let's test that against some new data. There are still errors. You see that this cat would be classified as a dog and this one is still at the interface. So our model is not uh, yet perfect. And so maybe by giving some more labels, it will improve. And indeed, now we have something that looks quite nice. And if I test that again, a new example, it will properly classify it as a dog. This can be done through the so-called uh, perceptron learning, which is the simplest neural network that exists, which is a very simple model of artificial neuron, like we have in the brain. Uh, the idea is that you have a number of input neurons uh, that, will take, um, that will correspond to the input image. So these are the values of the different pixels of this image. So let me emphasize that this machine, this algorithm, does not see this image. What it sees is really a huge vector of numbers and that's all. So it's, very, it's a very hard task to make sense of this huge vector of numbers. For us, it is very easy to guess that it's a cat because we're trained for that. But for uh, this machine, this is just numbers, a uh, lot of numbers. So the task is not so easy. And what, uh, what this machine does is that it takes these inputs and uh, it sums, so it, it, it projects that onto a so-called classifier, which essentially can be thought as the synaptic weights of this machine. And here you have an activation function that will take the sign of the sum of these inputs. The xi are the values of this input neuron, so the values of the pixels of this image, times the weights, which represent the synapses here. You can think of that as the sign of the linear projection of our input onto uh, the vector w, which is essentially the normal to this line here. So this vector w parameterizes our classifier. Okay? And uh, this sign, so the output neuron gives you this sign, and this is actually the class that you predict for uh, this data point, okay? And what the perceptron learning is doing is from many examples, it tries to learn these weights, these synaptic weights, in a way that it properly classify, classifies all the data from the training data. And then what you hope is that if you use it on a new example, it will output the proper label. Okay, so if you try to study this, uh, this simple neural network for a, for a simplified uh, data set, a bit, a bit simpler than this extremely complicated data set of images of cats and dogs, for a, for a type of data for which you can 
really develop a mathematic, mathematical theory and understand what happens. Then you can get formulas uh, that tell you what is the generalization error, that is the performance in classifying new unseen data of our uh, perceptron algorithm as a function of the amount of training data, okay? So the amount of training data here is our control parameter, is what we can play with. And this is our order parameter, which will define in which algorithmic complexity phase we are, okay? And what you observe is again a phase transition. So if the amount of data is not big enough, if you look at the optimal algorithm, and by optimal here, I mean that this curve has been computed thanks to a formula that we cannot actually run the, the optimal algorithm because it would take an exponential amount of time to, to be run. But fortunately, in this simple model, we can compute the, an exact formula. We have a theorem for that. And this is this red curve. And you see that there is a critical amount of data where you have again a phase transition. It drops suddenly. And above here, you have a kind of perfect learning. It means that essentially you find exactly the proper classifier between the two classes. But before this, this, this transition, you don't have perfect learning. So this can be defined as, as a phase, uh, like in physics. And in, now, let me test that again two efficient algorithms that, are, that I can actually run now on my computer. These are the, the black and, and blue dots. And what you see is that this fast algorithm, the, the, the black one, is able to match the optimal performances, except in this region here where you have a mismatch between the optimal algorithm, which would lead to perfect learning, and your actual uh, fast algorithm, which, uh, which, has a, which is not perfect. But if you give it a bit more of data, then you have another phase transition, and suddenly you enter this so-called easy learning phase, where now you have a, a simple, fast algorithm able to actually reach optimal performance. And in between, you have again this hard regime, like what we've seen in coloring, uh, for example, which is the kind of glassy phase of the problem. All right, so I'm essentially done. So I hope that I conveyed the, the main message, which was uh, that uh, the, the variety of systems in which this kind of uh, phase transitions and, and statistical physics notions can be applied is absolutely huge. Uh, and uh, may a priori like, look like very different and separated systems, but actually they can be described into a single framework. So I've discussed um, physical systems, um, um, animal behavior, computer science problems, communications, inference of signals, uh, financial markets and, and votes. But I could have talked also about quantum systems, neurosciences, DNA and protein folding, which is how proteins are um, place themselves, uh, the spreading of diseases in populations, of course, traffic jams, symmetry breaking in cosmology. And let me also emphasize that behind all that, there is not only the physics and algorithmic aspects, but there is tons of beautiful mathematical questions, which actually I'm very interested in. And um, I will stop there. Okay, so thank you very much for this beautiful talk. Uh, maybe we can all unmute ourselves and first give you a round of applause. Okay, so here comes the difficult part. Now, if anyone has any questions, we just want not everyone to speak at the same time since we are almost 100 participants here. So maybe if you can either raise your hand or just write in the chat that you have a question and I can, I can try to, to choose an order. So any questions? Maybe the diploma students. So okay, so question. yeah, there's a question. So, Wael El Deridi, sorry for the pronunciation. So, let's no, not a, <laughs> not, a, not a problem at all. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Jean. Very nice, very, very nice talk. Hi, Wael. Very clear. Very yeah, very clear and, um, and lots of nice examples. I'll start just a question from 
backwards, I mean, taking the, the algorithm's question, you wouldn't know a priori if you how an algorithm will follow that curve. If we look at your final slide of the black and blue algorithms, mm -hmm. you wouldn't know a priori yes. how it will behave. So the answer is, uh, in general, no. Uh, if you gain, uh, after working a lot in the field, uh, you gain a kind of intuition uh, in the sense in, uh, in which, if I take the machine learning example, in which scalings or the amount of data, the problem will be easy or hard. Uh, the precise numbers, of course, no, but in general, no, there is no um, recipe uh, to get, uh, to know in advance in which phase, algorithmic complexity phase you will, you will be uh, without doing actually quite involved computations. And this is the, the whole job of the statistical physicist and of the mathematician. To, to, to compute this, this, this free energy or these generalizations of free energy for these more abstract systems to actually get the phase diagram uh, properly, yeah. So, so, so to follow up, so, what, so knowing that there is a phase transition in whichever system I'm working on, does not, knowing it exists somewhere does not necessarily help me solve it. No, but uh, actually it at least helps you to to be careful in the sense that this kind of, let me take the example of the Shannon capacity, which I think it's, uh, it's, it's very enlightening about uh, this point. It, it's very important to know that there are fundamental limits and when you can quantify them, because imagine that Shannon would never got his, his theorem telling that there is an absolute fundamental maximum rate until which you can communicate maybe a full generation of coding theorists uh, working on communications would have worked uh, hope, I mean, without any hope at the end to, to develop algorithms able to beat this limit that they didn't know about uh, by improving algorithms. But actually there is no way to, to, to beat this limit. So it's very important to, to know in advance if your problem can uh, experience phase transitions or not, and if you can, to try to quantify it because you can then just lose time developing algorithms to, to, to get performance that there is no way to, to, to attain. Thank you. Okay, so we had another question as well from Ralph Gebauer, so. Yes, uh, hello everyone and Hi, thanks uh, Jean for, uh, <laughs> for this nice seminar. And um, there's one thing which is not very clear to me. In this part where you talked about Shannon and uh, communication and error in the communication, mm -hmm. then you said one can reconstruct or correct for errors thanks to these um, constraints, which in your yes. example, they are the sum of uh, the three consecutive bits must be even or something. Yes. So, but what happens if you try to use this and want to send a message which does not um, satisfy this constraint? Yes, so maybe I didn't emphasize that uh, enough. So what, what, I, what I said is that before communicating, the receiver and emitter, they agree that the only possible messages that will be communicated will, be, will verify this constraint. So if you, have, if you allow yourself uh, uh, constraints that generate a dictionary big enough, then you can map one to one any of these messages verif verifying the constraints to a message that you want to transmit. So you can always find what we call a code book, which is this huge dictionary of messages that verify the constraints to communicate. Okay, so in the example of this image, which was reconstructed, I imagine the rules were different from just the simple yes sum yes of yes of okay. course of course ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> of course yes thank you okay so it seems there are no more questions at the moment if you do of course you can still write um so i can seize this opportunity to tell you that we will do a little questionnaire here just to see if it you know if everything worked well or or not so I will start with a little poll that takes 20 seconds soon, and please answer that. It would be helpful before you, uh, you leave the meeting. And then I'm also thinking that maybe there are some diploma students, for example, who didn't dare to ask a question in front of all the 100 participants all over the world, right? So 
Uh, so maybe the diploma students can stay a little longer and they can get uh, another chance to, to ask questions to, to the speaker. And will we get okay. wine and food and snacks outside now or not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, this well, is what happens this normally, no? <laughs> this is something maybe you can take up in the fall and we will try to fix that for the next meeting. <laughs> Okay, so I will launch this poll now. Yes. Okay, Fernando is suggesting a group photo as well. Let's see. Ah. Okay, so Jean, there is actually a question here from Sayan uh, saying his mic is not working. So how do you relate the second order phase transitions to various systems is his question. Okay, so I think what Sian has in mind is that there are different type of phase transitions in the sense that uh, the most common phase transitions are what we call uh, first order and second order phase transition. So what it means is, um, so second, first order phase transition, it means that the first derivative of the free energy, which is the fundamental object that allows to describe the, the thermodynamic and the, the the global properties of the system, there exists a, a first derivative, which is discontinuous, okay? Uh, a second order phase transition is when you have a second derivative that is di discontinuous. In the, in the latter case, when you plot uh, the order parameter, like, uh, um, like uh, I mean, anything that I plot here, the, the, the algorithm, the performance of an algorithm as a function of the amount of data, for example, Second order means that it would be continuous. It would be smoothly varying. While the first order means that you have a discontinuity like, like most of the cases I, I've shown here. Um, there is no rule in the sense that in these systems, you may have the two types of phase transitions. I emphasize more the first order type because they're more visual. And this, in this kind of high dimensional problems, this is more typical in the sense. But for example, in the biological systems, when we've seen this V-shake model where the correlation, the alignment between the birds was increasing smoothly as a function of the decrease of the noise, this was more a kind of second order phase transition. But the two can happen. This really depends on the system. Okay, very good. So um now i guess we can ask to take this group photo it was suggested so then i ask everyone to please switch on their cameras switch on the video and we will see if we manage to to take yeah. this picture yes with all the 60 plus participants that are still here suddenly it becomes a bit more <laughs> yes <laughs> Yeah, so now you can see everyone who was here. Uh, well, I least. suggested it, but I'm not quite sure how to do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, certainly we, we don't all fit in one screen. So I, what I could do is uh, just stay still and I take a picture one at a time with my phone. I think a mixture of technologies uh, maybe. But you, you can do a screenshot maybe also. Yeah, but the... I tried this and uh, okay. I, uh, before it didn't seem to work. I can try that, but. Uh, okay. Uh, Fernando, I can do it. Um, no okay, Sabrina yeah. can do it. Okay, I, I see that there are three three um, groups so we come yeah, out. Yeah, okay? we can. We Just can a do second, three. I will do. Well, the screenshot actually works, so I can do that too. Just to have uh... one. So people want to turn their camera on? Oh, in the, in the, no, not all. Uh, Bogdan, Panju. No, they are saying that uh, if they have the camera on. If they, if they are so kind. Uh, Sergeant Nunez, Sog, Ikram, Dennis, who? Please. Well, may, maybe they don't want to, so we don't oh, have to force okay. anyone. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, those that are willing, if, if, it would be nice uh, uh, to turn the camera on. Um, I'm on page two. I'm going to try uh, another screenshot. Somebody has um, a penguin, so I think that. <laughs> Oh. That's not uh, real. <laughs> All right. So. Oh, now so, we have we have just. Uh, yeah. People left. Yeah, we are. People just yeah. care about the science, not this mm. uh, this kind of stuff. <laughs> wait, wait, one more. 
Okay, I think that I have them. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So thank everyone. And okay, so I think uh, everybody, the so the diploma students could stay. Perhaps.